So we, we need your attention, please. We would like to start with a few questions for Professor Munizange. And uh, we would like to take two questions and then you'll kindly answer. Um, do we have a microphone? Yes, we do. Yes, please, Mark. Hi, Mark Drew. My, my question is, um, you've been in this landscape for a long time. And um, one of the things that I observe is uh, sudden and rapid acceleration uh, and new conversations emerging. How do you stay plugged into that and, um, and um, uh, stay contemporary in your, in your work? Thank you, Mark. Could we have another question, please? Just Rodrigo. Thank you. Um, I'm involved in poverty alleviation in Chile very heavily. And so I want to hear your reaction to the cover of The Economist about, there's a man from The Economist somewhere here in the room. The cover of The Economist about two issues ago that uh, we as humanity have lessened the amount of poor in about a billion. Uh, and it came as a very big article, even in the cover, mainly of which, of course, has been done in China, about 600 million of that billion. So how do you react to that in terms of uh, the good argument that we are doing our work in terms of alleviating poverty, as, as you know, said by the economist? You should we? Yes, please. I, I'll try to keep my answers uh, brief because uh, once again I'm standing between you and a good desert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, in terms of um, keeping plugged in, the difficulty is the increasing amount of information, but the positive side is that the internet is a great equalizer. I used to work in Washington for 30 years uh, in the World Bank. It was very nice because all the information came to me. I took early retirement and went to Sri Lanka, and I found that I could keep up because of the internet and uh, a very good set of, uh, of colleagues who, who are able to troll the net. The other part is, of course, a more traditional method, which is peers. You, at any given time, if you want to know about what is happening in trade, there are a few people you, who you know personally, who uh, you network with, who will tell you, you know, because they are your friends. And that's uh, months of uh, research that they'll give you in five minutes. So those are the two methods I personally use. <laughs> there may be others, but um, on the poverty issue, I mean, this is a debate that has been going on a long time. Is the glass half empty or is it half full? And I would say, if you look at the report of the eminent persons uh, to the United Nations Secretary General, which came out, um, if you read it carefully or superficially, you'd think, oh, the Millennium Development Goals and everything was very successful because we reduced poverty and so on. As the, uh, our colleague from Chile said, mainly this is the effort of, of China. Okay? If you took China away and you threw in Sub-Saharan Africa, you find a, a, a different argument. My point is this. Uh, it is good to be symmetrical about the positives and the minuses, but the minuses have the potential to do you much more harm. So certainly let us enjoy the good side, the upside, but we have to be especially careful about the downside, which is why I emphasize that, because that is what is going to send us off the cliff. But I agree that there have been some successes and we should continue uh, so that uh, we, we at least reinforce the positive side. But be more uh, uh, aware and uh, uh, more careful about the downside. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Gustavo uh, and then this gentleman here. Could you speak more briefly about the poverty problem? So, uh, uh, sorry. The we listen to you with you the mic. Uh, yeah. Gustavo Montero, you spoke briefly uh, about the poverty bubble and models going forward that have been done along these lines. What do you think is going to happen if we don't fix the issue of poverty in terms of the bubble bursting? 
particularly along the lines of massive immigration from, from Africa into Europe. Thank you. Another question over here. Over here. There was one here. And then okay. the, the maybe we start with the lady. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Serena Brown. I work Sorry. with KPMG. Thank you um, very much for what you shared with us. Um, you talked about making pricing and markets work better. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work on natural capital accounting and how to internalize some of these externalities. Um, and we're also part of an integrated reporting pilot to try and move companies from reporting retrospective financials to looking at reports that focus on drivers of future value. And I wonder how optimistic you are about how far they could go if they become the mainstream way that companies report. Um, and just a quick second question. In all the discussions around the sustainable development goals, a lot of people from all different parts of um, you know, business and civil society have been saying that we need to have something around inequality. And I saw one draft of the goals and there was something around you know, all the countries reducing their Gini coefficient by 30%. And the next iteration that was taken out because it was deemed to be not really you know, a good target given different starting levels and too political. Um, I just wonder if you have any ideas in that regard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, two uh, rather deep <coughs> questions, but I'll try to give quick answers. Um, the poverty bubble, I think the problem is the interaction of the various crises. For example, uh, if climate change uh, has, uh, for example, an increase in the severity and uh, number of extreme events, storms, and so on. This could greatly exacerbate uh, the plight of the poor, lead, as you said, to mass migrations, movements across the uh, borders, and so on. And what happens when uh, 100,000 people uh, approach a, a border? I mean, are, are, is the defending country, so to speak, going to order its border guards to shoot them? <laughs> well, you, you're going to reach the... the Potential for environmental refugees is, uh, is a serious problem. Up to now, uh, the magnet has been more economic. I mean, people go to other countries illegally in the, in the search for jobs. But I mean, the interaction of these various crises is going to burst that poverty bubble. Okay, and then I think we'll have a rather chaotic conditions. This is uh, one of the scenarios that we that I've worked on called fortress world. Fortress world is essentially where you have the rich living in um, fortress communities, uh, living well, and the poor live outside and, and die outside under miserable conditions. Now, in a sense, um, I mean, I, I don't want to make this sound, but what has happened after, say, 9-11 is a bit of that, that you have find it much more difficult to move uh, in a sense, I go in and out of the U.S. often. I find it is a fortress world in a sense yes. compared to what it yeah, was before 9-11. Sure. Yeah, sure. But people are accepting that mentality. Do we want to go into that? So that is one of the ways that the poverty bubble could uh, uh, burst and, and uh, e evolve. Mm -hmm. And this is not a world, I think, that is uh, we would like to, to live in. Right? Um, on the question of uh, integration of sustainability into, into business. I think pricing is uh, an uh, important tool, but also we must remember the three aspects of the triangle that come in. <coughs> if you use the economic rule, you raise prices because you want prices to reflect the scarcity cost. This is good economics, right? Environment tells you raise prices even more because you add pollution and externality taxes. But the social dimension tells you a different story. Mm -hmm. It says if you raise the prices so high that the poor cannot afford, say, a basic thing like food, then this is unsustainable. So you have to balance. And that is the, the difficult part about pricing. How do we uh, target the poor and provide them with subsidies or some elements to allow them to survive? Mm -hmm. That's why I gave the first millennium consumption goal as explicitly saying we meet the basic needs first. Yes. And then afterwards, we take care of economic efficiency and all the other things. Right? 
But that's because I've been working on poverty for 40 years. It shows my bias. Uh, on the sustainable development goals, I think it's a, you know, it's a mixed bag in the sense that I think the Millennium Development Goals, the advantage it had was simplicity. There were just eight. Some progress has been made, limited, but we were sort of getting there. Now we are saying, let's dump to a different set of goals. And because we are opening the gate, the debate on sustainable development goals in the UN, unfortunately, is becoming very chaotic because everybody and uh, their friend wants to put in their own goal. So if we wind up with 50 goals, everything is going to be di diluted and we don't have the priorities. So, I mean, I have mixed reaction on that. I think inequality should come into the uh, Millennium Development Goals, but through the meeting of basic needs, which is why I propose that first Millennium Consumption Goal. Thank you very much. We had one question here and one there, and I think then over here. Shall I go? Yeah, please, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rob Cameron uh, from Sustainability. Thank you, Professor. I'm over here, by the way. Yep, there yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, the, the light, 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 light. I know, I know. No, I'm with you. That's why I'm waving away. And uh, thank you. I, I, I agree with so much of what you said. And uh, I spent the morning with a, a group of people talking about nutrition, mostly um, uh, in the developing world. And uh, I, I share your concern about that. Um, uh, one quick point, uh, you've touched on GDP slash GNP as a measure. Uh, Simon Kuznets, when he invented GDP, made the point that this was not a particularly good way to measure the welfare of a nation, and yet somehow we've got locked into it. And I think that the more of us that are uh, hammering away that this is not a particularly good measure of the welfare of a nation, uh, the better. Um, one, one aspect of population growth um, that we were talking around around the table here that I wonder if you'd like to comment on is the mix of population as we move to a vec you know we talk about 9 billion in 2050 in fact the vector is much wider than that could be lower could be much higher but in any event globally the population is going to be much different from how it's mixed today and the significant number one in five people on the planet will be over the age of 65 and i wonder how that figures in your forecast and your thinking about the state of society as we move forward over the next de decades, the increasing number of people over the age of 65. Thank you. We had one more here, please. You've mentioned a couple of times how important pricing was, and I think in this room at least we all agree that that's probably the case. I read a report a couple of uh, months ago that looked in at pricing um, uh, the ecological resources of a country and came to the conclusion that the ecology in this country was worth about $2,400, roughly the cost of an expensive MacBook Pro. And I thought, brilliant, I should just buy all of their biocapacity and then I sell it back to them for everything they have because clearly they need biocapacity to survive. There seems to be a paradox of pricing natural resources in that water in this country is worth nothing, or at least we pay hardly anything for it, but if it becomes truly scarce, yeah, yeah. the price is almost yeah. infinite. We would give everything we have. How would you reconcile that paradox, or is it not a paradox? Uh, yeah. Should we take these two or one yeah, more? Uh, we'll take these two because they're there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, I, I agree with uh, the point on GNP. Um, the, uh, Danger is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's not a question of replacing GNP 100%. It's a question of supplementing it. There are other indicators which give a better uh, sense of human well-being. But I think material production and efficient uh, production are important aspects. Uh, without efficiency, I think uh, we, would be, uh, we would not have the modern world as it is. So it's, 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 it's important to keep that balance in mind. Um, in terms of the population pyramid, I fully agree. Countries which have reduced uh, their uh, birth rate are now uh, having second thoughts. In fact, China is easing up, for example, on its one China policy a little bit because of this aging population issue. The, the question then becomes more a biological point because 
uh, in the old days you had mandatory retirement at 55 or whatever. But I think older people like myself can be productive uh, and contribute to society for a much longer period. So I think uh, we have to find creative ways of including, this is an inclusion issue. Uh, inclusion, exclusion doesn't apply only to poor people. We must <laughs> include those people. We must go, that's also breaking the barriers of thinking uh, that the older generation have and will continue uh, to contribute to society and that is one way of taking care of the problem of the aging population. Eventually though, we have to face the problem of a steady state kind of world. And what is the population pyramid we need? Uh, I don't know, I mean, but I think people, demographers and others are working on this problem. Um, on the valuation question, and I think this also touches on the point uh, that uh, uh, the KPMG colleague made. Um, there are many tools to value the environment. One of the difficulties in economics in valuation in general is that we value marginally, at the margin, then we apply that value to the entire body of the resource. So even in the stock market, you can have a million shares in the market, but if one share is traded at a certain price, it revalues the entire million shares. But if those million shares went into the market, the price would be not at the marginal value. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's a kind of a, a fallacy here. Distortion. Distortion mm -hmm. in the way that we've had. Same thing with resources. If the resource is abundant, if you have one person uh, living uh, in, in, in before a huge river, the value of water is zero because it is not a scarce resource. If you have a million people living with a thin trickle of water, then it's a very different question. So economics has a role, role to play. Scarcity comes in, marginality comes in. I teach a whole course on this, so I cannot, but there is no paradox really. It's the way we, we look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing to remember is that uh, the collapse syndrome that you can use ecological resource right up to the limit and then the resource, the, the system collapses and you lose everything. Then the entire support system <coughs> goes with it. Mm -hmm. So the idea is not to move close to the margin, to stay away from the resource constraint as far as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We had, um, who, ha who has the, the microphone? Here, please, could you, could you tell, you, uh, tell us your name, yes. please? Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Crystal Rosenkiller Christensen um, from Treasure Group, and thank you very much for a very inspiring speech. Um, when you're talking about transcendent barriers, I'm wondering how you normally address that, since you spend a moment to talk about it now, and I guess you, you also spend time in your teachings with this because I'm working um, with a concept that I built with energistic leadership and energistic responsibility during keynotes in, um, for multinationals and politi political forums. And I'm, um, my, my message put forward very um, shortly put is to make people understand that energistic responsibility that we, we have and let go of the linear regressions and the traditional uh, mindset of how things have to work, um, that we have to um, answer to the system when we are building uh, new strategies, new innovative processes, or whatever we may work. How do you address this when you when you work with your um, when you work with your clients and teachings? Thank you. I think <laughs> Professor Braga. Carlos Primo Braga, I am the former director, of Economic Policy World Bank. Uh, I found quite interesting the points that you made. But at the same time, I have a little bit of mixed feelings. My definition of mixed feelings is when you see your mother-in-law going over a cliff in your brand new BMW. <laughs> because to a certain extent, you said that uh, leadership at this point in time, we should not expect leadership from governments. And I, at the same time, business as usual, it's not going to address the problems that we are facing in the area of environment. 
inevitably then comes the question, well, you all, people participating for a like the Zermatt Summit, can make a difference. But how exactly can would you say <laughs> can we make this difference? Because if governments are not going to act, then we are going to be in deep trouble. And in this context, for instance, what is your view in terms of uh, technological <coughs> progress? Is there a hope? Because there are some that are very optimist about technological developments, like, for instance, fracking. What is your position with respect to fracking and its impact on climate change? Thank you. Should we answer these yes, questions? I think we can. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, again, uh, interesting questions. I think um, I can answer the question of out motivating people because I'm not uh, expert on motivation and so on, but I use um, common sense. The, the first thing is is not to pay on play on people's guilt. I mean, we don't say, look, you are doing this. You have to change. That you have to be more positive, and to be more positive is to um, suggest the win-win kind of thing, saying, look, if you change in this certain way, there are certain benefits to yourself as well. Um, and also to give important counter examples where peers in some other company or in some other city have done this, and uh, it has not been so difficult or painful, and they have actually benefited. So. I think a little bit of searching can find those counterexamples and uh, search out the kind of win-win options. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you can't sugarcoat the pill too much. There are hard trade-offs that have to be made. Mm -hmm. So eventually, you have to accept that. You have to be honest. It's a blend, right? But above all, do I mean, I refrain from playing on people's guilt. I think that <laughs> works only a very short time. Um, the other, I mean, personally, uh, you know, this is a very personal part. Uh, I, I find uh, meditation helps. I mean, uh, for the last 50 years, whatever, I've been medi 30 minutes of meditation every morning as I get up. Mm -hmm. And um, the number one thing I find is that it is the ego that gets in the way. Mm -hmm. It is this personal thing, the fierce desire to succeed and so on at any cost. And that is part of the whole consumerist culture and uh, the greed thing, which is actually manipulated very skillfully by people in advertising and so on uh, to, to achieve their ends. But in the long run, as we were talking at our table, this is a race to the bottom. Everybody thinks they are gaining the upper hand, but everybody is going down the tubes at the same time. So uh, one of the important things personally, I mean, uh, the meditation is not something I recommend <laughs> as, as no, a, a religious teacher, but it's <laughs> important to reflect on your place in, in the scheme of things and to see what sort of person you are in terms of your actions and how selfish you are or unselfish. And every day you remind yourself of that, that helps. Okay? Humility trumps hubris every time. Okay, that's my motto. I think my colleague from the World Bank, I mean, I spent um, many, 28 years, and one, one of the things I did was develop the environmental policy for the World Bank. Um, and uh, I mean, some of these questions also came up. And also the World Bank made its own transition of trying to become more open uh, in, in, in the process of consultative and so on. Now, uh, now, on the question of how to make a difference, uh, what I have suggested is that we are not saying that leaders have no role. What we are saying is if we leave it only to them, then the pace of change will be too slow to avert some kind of catastrophe. So we must move at different levels, at multiple levels, at the grassroots, but more importantly, at the middle level, as I said, the leaders of communities, mayors, uh, CEOs of companies, and so on. At those levels, I think we can have faster movement to complement what the leaders are doing. But eventually, I mean, the UN and the international community 
have to also agree on all of these things. But we have to push them. So I'm, I'm not saying throw one thing out. It's not either or. It's all of the above. On technology progress, I mean, as I said, on the production uh, efficiency and uh, sustainability of production is deeply embedded in the concept of technical efficiency and economic efficiency both, okay? Uh, that you br bring the right mix of resources in, but also that each technical process is very efficient. However, you do need the consumption sustainability to come in simply because of a simple thing we learn in economics, uh, in the economic history, called Jevons paradox, that uh, some centuries ago, uh, uh, Stanley Jevons, a British economist, discovered that when coal technology improved rapidly in the Industrial Revolution, he thought, why doesn't the consumption of coal actually go down? Mm -hmm. Because you're using less coal to produce the same amount of heat. But in fact, every time technology improved, the consumption of coal increased because the savings from the efficiency increase was used to buy more coal. So the point for uh, production efficiency today is we can become super efficient. Um, as my friend uh, Ernst von Weissacker says, he has factor 10 as an argument saying we can improve efficiency of resource use by a factor of 10. But eventually, if human greed is not curtailed, or greed for material things, we will keep on demanding and consuming more so that it will overwhelm the productive efficiency. And so therefore, con uh, sustainable consumption by changing values, bringing in ethical and other concepts is extremely important if we want to bring the change about. It's not an easy ask, but it has to be done. Thank you. I think we will limit the number of questions. Otherwise, we, I think you have a lot of energy, so we could go on. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Who else? Yes. yes. Please, can you tell yes, us hi. your name? My mm. name is Jan Notterdam from CSI Europe. But it happens I'm also teaching at university, and I was hired by a professor um, with a famous sl slogan, it's time to burn business schools. Uh, they are producing robots of capitalism. I thought it was very radical some years ago. I think I start to agree with him, because what I see is, um, we are producing obesity in brains that is preventing that integrated thinking you are asking for. Um, and the link with the constant concert we received, and I really thank you for that, because you have been placing what I think is the most important, how to bet on the emotional, even spiritual intelligence of people. Once you start on that domain, Creativity emerge, motivation. You give a license to values, as you mentioned. And that is so much missing, especially in business schools. But once you start that journey, then you can start to have some hope because creativity is flowing. And the question to these future managers, not even the CEOs, even middle management, is not what is going to make you happy. What is going to give meaning to your private and professional life. But that is not being taught. Huh? So teaching the mana jedis, that's something that we are also using, a Jedi knows what is inside himself. All the time, all his life. What is his weaknesses and strengths? Focusing on that is helping less obesity in brains, I think. Thank you. We have here. Um, Marcello Palazzi, Progress Foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, I want to link uh, your very inspiring talk to one of the subjects here, which is civil society. And in fact, you know, uh, you as a Nobel Prize winner and uh, other Nobel Prize winners, you have a fantastic platform from which you could actually articulate, uh, sort of be a pressure group, uh, engage with governments. So the question is, have you tried to get the other Nobel Prize winners together on a sustainability platform and actually become, in a way, a strength in civil society, which is also something that is very needed in civil society. Shall we take those two? 
question? Yes. Yeah? yeah, sorry, two at a time because I can't focus on more things. Uh, I can't integrate all of that at the same time. Um, yeah, I mean, I won't uh, comment uh, on the point about the business schools because I fully agree with every point that was made. And uh, one of the things I make a point now is accept every invitation to speak to business school graduates because to bring in ethical and other values. But I think that has to be followed up within companies and those of you who are CEOs. I mean, to change the incentive and reward structure because all those ethical values disappear very quickly when the first person goes on his first sales job and he's judged entirely on how much he has sold by hook or by crook, okay? And that, I mean, often it is through corruption. So uh, I, I think uh, th this has to flow, but we have to start with the young people uh, laying the right foundation, so I won't say more on that. Um, on the uh, civil society thing, I mean, the platform, let me make, and this is following my own dictum of humility, I did not win a Nobel Prize. I shared one as a member of the, uh, vice chair of the IPCC. But let me tell you, a small share of a Nobel Prize is better than none. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I work with President Gorbachev, for example, on the, I'm on the board of Green Cross International. There is a thing called the, uh, uh, the Society of Nobel Peace Prize laureates who occasionally have uh, these kinds of uh, meetings uh, and sustainability is one of the themes, but they have others like peace and so on. I mean, Desmond Tutu goes around. And so, we, we have to share the limelight, but it is important. I think it's an important platform. It is also an important responsibility. But I can tell you personally that with the, uh, the QDOS also comes a sharp fall in creativity. Okay, uh, winning a prizes, Nobel or otherwise, is death to creative because you have find very little time for research. You find a lot of time for speaking and other public engagements, so it is a trade-off. Uh, one has to mine away one's capital, but occasionally I have to retire to my laboratory or my research thing to replenish that capital. Uh, so I, I take your point. We have a responsibility, the social responsibility. We are trying to do that. Thank you very much. Shall we take this? Yes, Mark Foster, International Business Leaders Forum. Um, one of the keys to your, 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 your very, very strong series of messages was the importance of responsible consumerism and responsible consumption as the key to unlock this whole model. And yet, you know, history has shown us that human behavior, and we see it now in, whether in India or China, that as they get wealth and income, consumption does appear to move up and move up quite dramatically. And when we talk about the, the parties coming together to resolve that, business, NGOs, and government, it seems we, we often miss out the fourth estate, which is actually the consumers and the citizens themselves. And I wonder, how do you see, uh, to the theme of this, this, this conference, partnerships or the interactions actually really changing the, the, the flow of direction on that very fundamental, it appears, human need, that when you have more, you want to consume more? One more question, which will probably be the last. Hi. I, uh, <coughs> my question links to, to something you were saying before. Getting a Nobel Prize could be an end in itself, but for you it seems to be a mean. So could you, if you don't mind, could you share with us why you keep doing what you do? Okay. Shall I take that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, responsible consumerism. I mean, if you look at it from a deep scientific viewpoint, uh, in, uh, if from a biological perspective, there is, I mean, I'm not an expert on biology, but there is a sense that organisms have a tendency to expand and occupy their ecological niche space as much as possible. And it leads to these uh, boom and collapse kind of phenomena, which is fine you know, if you're a deer or something else, but you don't want 
uh, human beings dying by the 100 million to correct uh, some overconsumption problem. And this is what we're trying to interfere in. So there is a kind of biological drive. It's partly, I'm told, that in, ancient, uh, in, in prehistoric times, when people came across a food supply, it, it was uncertain. So you gorged yourself and you ate as much as you could because you didn't know when the next meal was coming. So I mean, that kind of primitive thinking may be still driving us. And it is certainly being tweaked by the advertisers very successfully. Sure. Now, I'm working with a group of responsible advertisers uh, who are, we, we, they can say, they say, we can tweak you the other way. We can make you very sustainable, but we must find sustainable producers who will buy our products. So this is where the balance comes in that in my s model, if you have a small group of sustainable consumers who are looking for sustainable products which they cannot find, and a small group of sustainable producers who are looking for sustainable consumers, otherwise they cannot survive in the marketplace, I think they should form a, 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 a circle that uh, supports each other, and eventually that sustainable consumerism spreads throughout society. I mean, that's a kind of model. But here you have to start with communities and cities and other groups, even a company. I mean, if the uh, leadership uh, is serious about making sure that those values permeate right down to the grassroots, mm -hmm. you can make some changes. Um, there is a limit to, of course, voluntarism because, I mean, it, it, all these little actions are not necessarily going to add up to adequate amount at the global level, let us say, to reduce greenhouse gas emission. So somewhere, we have to get the leaders also to buy in. But as the mayor of Bonn, Mayor Nimsch said, if enough people at the bottom have taken action, it energizes the leaders to, take the, 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 to make the correct response. So that is my point about that. Why do I continue very simply passing the torch on? I mean, I've reached an age where I know I have a limited shelf life, okay? Uh, so um, this is kind of unfinished business. We feel that, I mean, this is very personal, that we are leaving the world in worse shape than when I got it. And I'm a child of the 60s. I was talking in, at the table here. That generation were awful. I think the, we were the despair of our parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember walking through the snows of New Hampshire, um, campaigning against Lyndon Johnson. But you see, that generation, because of their angst, in spite of being nasty and bad to their parents, they achieved something. They got a sitting president of the United States to refuse the nomination. Just imagine if you got Obama or uh, whoever to refuse the nomination. But Lyndon Johnson turned down the nomination, and I know that George Bundy, who was his Secretary of State, came to MIT and addressed us, and he said, you are the people who got the president to, to stand down. Mm -hmm. Because he felt that once you lose faith in the, of the younger generation, there's no hope. Right. In Europe, the, pre the president of, uh, of France, Charles de Gaulle, resigned because of a student movement and led by Comte Bondy and others. And, I mean, mm -hmm. Now, I mean, a lot of us have become very bourgeois and sort of, you know, uh, toned down now. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm trying to make is there is a sense of unfinished business that we could not complete that. I hope we have gone through several generations in between who have opted for a more comfortable life, a better job, you know, BMW, whatever. We are now coming to a new generation, hopefully, who will have that fire again because they are facing a different set of crises. If they don't act, they are not going to have a world to live in. So mm -hmm. maybe the next generation will make the change. Mm -hmm. And I want to be there to make sure that I did my bit. Thank you very much.